Hi, I'm Henry Alonga. Tonight, Crash Craddock catches up with a man who played cricket for two countries. He played 40 test matches between 1982 and 1994 and hit six centuries at an average of just over 40. His name is Kepler Christoffel Vessels, and he is a cricket legend. Welcome to Cricket Legends, Kepler, and welcome back to Australia. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks for spending uh, a lot of time these days back in Brisbane, which we're loving, so uh, awesome to be back. It's interesting your connection to Australia, even beyond your, your test career, uh, is the compatibility of, of you and the country. Like, I know a lot of the boys said that <laughs> you're almost happiest when the mickey was being taken out of you in the dress room, even though you were quite a serious guy? Well, I was. Uh, it took a while for me to, to get the Australian humour, so to speak. I think I went through the first 12 months not really knowing what was going on and just uh, basically nodding my head, I think. But then once I worked it out, I absolutely loved it. We had a, a terrific dressing room in Queensland. We were all contemporaries together, the same age, roughly. And uh, I always say the seven years that I spent with, uh, with Queensland was the most enjoyable time of my, uh, of my cricket career, definitely. How about earlier on, your first year at World Series, entering a dressing room with Marsh, Lily Chapel as a 21-year-old? Did, did they take their eyes out of you much? Or? Oh, all the time. Non-stop, actually. It started right from the very first practice when uh, Rod Marsh gave me my nickname and uh, I was very fortunate on, on that tour. In those days, we still shared rooms, uh, not like today, and, and I roomed with Dennis Lilly for the whole time, just about. And what an experience that was. And, I mean, Dennis then was a, a world-class fast bowler and, uh, and, and he was very good to me. I was just a young bloke making my way. And he treated me well, he helped me out and, uh, and, and, and basically um, helped me through those weeks of, of World Series cricket, which was just a, a terrific experience. Is there anything you learn why Dennis Lilly became Dennis Lilly? Like you said, I'll tell you something that made him great. Well... His professionalism, I thought that he, he was always meticulous in his preparation. If you had two practices before the match, he would make sure that he bowled flat out of his full run out for 45 minutes or an hour just to make sure that everything was quite right. And he'd repeat that one more time before the actual game started so that everything was just working smoothly by the time the game happened. Wouldn't happen today, would it? In right. all honesty, that would be banned, wouldn't it? Well, exactly. And, I mean, that's one of the difficult things to understand because, uh, I mean, I'm not saying you should go overboard, but a lot of bowlers, the more they bowl, the better they get. And, I mean, Dennis was one of those guys. And uh, also, let me tell you, a net practice facing Dennis Lilly wasn't always a safe place to be. <laughs> <laughs> you played in an era where guys would generally play for a club, a state yep. and a country, yet your career was so turbulent, wasn't it? All these forces swirling around, like... Yeah, there must have been times when it almost did your head in. Well, it did. I, I think and it, it, it dropped me from a little bit of a joy of just playing cricket at times. And I think that that's where I really appreciated that Australian humour in the change room because that was an escape from all that. And, uh, and, and the friendships that I made there and the good times that we had with the, the Queensland team and the Australian teams um, helped a lot to, to sort of put that to the back of my mind. But at that time, I suppose it was inevitable that that was always going to be there. Everyone's got one image of you, and mine is when you were hit in the groin by Colin Croft mm. and it knocked you out. I yep. mean, you're a tough guy, yep. but it knocked you out, you got up and you scored a century against the West Indies. To me, that summed up not just your toughness, but your desperation. Yeah, it happened at, uh, at Veerfield Park in Melbourne, I think, and, and fortunately it was a day-night match, so it happened five minutes before the dinner break. And uh, I got hit badly. And yes, as you rightly point out, I was knocked out. But for me, it was always not to give an inch. I didn't like to show pain, but on that occasion, I didn't have any choice. It was just so painful that I had to go off. And uh, a lot of treatment uh, in the dinner break. But uh, yeah, came out and, and, and continued. Kepler, if you were playing today, by then you probably would have been a multi-millionaire. But back then, you had to prove yourself. And was that all part of getting up? That desperation, like, I'm on trial here. I've got to get up. It was that because I think in that Australian change room with the, the Chapel brothers and, and Rod Marsh and Dennis Lilly, uh, to name a few, I think respect was the issue. I think you had to earn your stripes, you had to earn respect. And if you couldn't do that, you are going to struggle. But uh, equally, if you did, then your road ahead was going to be a lot easier. Tell us what it was like growing up as a young guy in Bloemfontein in the apartheid era. Yeah, I grew up. Bloemfontein was a, a very Afrikaans-speaking community. So South Africa at the time when I was about, say, 13, 14, 
still in international sport. That's when Bobby Simpson brought a, a touring side over, and then in 1970, Bill Laurie brought one over. So that's where my love for cricket developed, which was quite unusual because in Bloemfontein it was all rugby. Rugby was the game and athletics and things like that, but not cricket. So then after the, the Bill Laurie tour in 1970, South Africa got isolated, but um, my love for cricket was formed. And that's when I really started to, uh, to push hard and to play and to try and break through. What was a young man's view of apartheid? In, in your book, you said we were just indoctrinated, mm. that blacks were here and whites were there and you didn't really talk about it? Uh, well, you, you absolutely didn't. And uh, you were just brought up that that's the way that the country worked and that's the way it should work. From a, a government point of view, you had to be careful of what you said and, and because you could be ostracised in, in, in your community. But uh, as I said, it, it was definitely not something that you questioned. Once you went overseas and you looked from outside in, then you started to, uh, to question some of the things that was happening, but not while you were living in the country itself. Was there any moment you had overseas when you thought, oh, things at home just don't seem right to me now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I went to England first, just after I left school. In fact, the first time I went, I was still at school. So I went for a brief period and then I joined Sussex uh, as a professional. And then from there came to Australia. And by that time, by the age of, say, 2021, you realised that, well, things, things don't appear to be right. And uh, you, you started to understand where the sports boycott came from, all these things that were happening. And it was a difficult adjustment to see a different perspective or to, to understand a different perspective. But uh, fortunately, at that time, as a sportsman, you could still travel the world and you could still broaden your, your base and, and, and the, things that you, the way you saw things. So that was an advantage. Most people would not be aware of this, but as a young Afrikaner cracking into an English-speaking game like cricket in South Africa, you had enormous challenges, didn't you? Yeah, I was the first one who broke through, really, from uh, the Afrikaans-speaking community. So cricket in South Africa at, time, at that time was a, an elite sport, an English elite sport. So when I broke through into first-class cricket at, at the age of 16 and, and playing against guys like Mike Proctor and Barry Richards and, the, and Graham Pollock and these sort of, these sort of players, uh, they gave you a hard time. They gave me a hard time and, and they didn't really make you feel welcome. So... But that too was good for me because it made me very determined to try and prove myself and to prove that I could be as good as them or better. And, and you once said you could almost feel the vibe sometimes that they thought you were a, quote, stupid Dutchman. Yeah, that was the, the inference. Um, the game is not for you guys. You know, you should go and play rugby or do the things that you're good at. And, uh, and that definitely was an inference at that time. Of course, it's all changed now. I mean, you have so many people now uh, and since then who have come through the Afrikaans-speaking side of the community into cricket and have done very well. So it was, uh, it was good to break the ice and to open up uh, cricket for, for everyone, I guess. Then, of course, you went to Sussex and you played under Tony Gregg. That must have been interesting because he obviously rated you to get your World Series uh, cricket contract. That was my breakthrough and, and it all happened on a very cold uh, summer's day at Tunbridge Wells in England and I managed to bat through the innings to get 100 and uh, that's when I got signed up to, uh, to join World Series. So I guess that that was my big break under Tony Gregg, yeah. So you signed with Packer. Did the players accept you in the World Series team? Because you came in as an outsider and a, essentially a non-Australian, didn't they? Yeah, they did, absolutely. I, I think what helped was the fact that I played in that Cavalier setup before I joined the, the main Australian squad and there are quite a few Australian players in that. But, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I felt very welcome in that environment from the beginning. And I think that was due to, I mean, Ian Chappell was captain, he was a magnificent captain. And uh, I think that he made me feel welcome and so did the other senior players. Why was he such a magnificent captain, Chappell? I've often thought about that and I think the thing about it is that when you played under him, you thought you could take on anyone. I mean, he gave you a confidence and a belief that made you feel like you could take on the West Indies, you could take on anybody. And, uh, and he, he always, uh, he was in, in the fight, in the front, he'd be fighting the battle, and uh, he, he was really somebody that you wanted to follow. I'd have loved to have seen a meeting between a young, bashful Kepler and right. Kerry Packer. <laughs> Like, did you have many moments with him at all? There was two, actually. The, the one that stands out vividly in my mind was during World Series, uh, I played in the first Super Test and got 46 in the second innings, and I thought, well, I, did, I was quite happy, actually. I thought I did quite well. And uh, he walked past me and uh, he called me over and said, uh, 
mate, I don't import people to get 40s, so get your act together. So, so, so that was my first meeting. And I thought, well, I better better just stay clear of, clear of him for a while. But then after World Series, then there was a, a phone call that didn't, didn't go too well. Hey, you <laughs> we must this up. I yeah. heard the phone call was reverse charges, <laughs> wasn't it? it, it that's the it truth, It probably was, it? because no cell phone. So I was phoning from Brighton somewhere and I had to get through. I thought, well, there's one or two ways this could go. It could either be a very short phone call, which at the end it was, or it could be a long phone call, so I better reverse the charge. But that is true bravery, ringing yeah. Kerry Packer from England reverse <laughs> charges. And that was, of course, over where you were going to play, wasn't it? Yeah, so what happened, Will Series just finished abruptly. I mean, we all thought it was going to carry on for a while. I worked a little bit with Greg, and Greg negotiated a deal with, uh, with in Queensland with, with Ron McConnell, and so it was all signed and sealed, uh, probably midway through the year, uh, July, August. And then right towards the end, I just got a message through that uh, you'll be playing in New South Wales this year. So I said, well, I can't really do that. I've already signed a contract. And that was when the phone call happened. Were the players scared of Packer? I think everybody was probably, except for maybe Ian Chappell, I think. I remember him speaking his mind uh, quite forcefully, actually, after one of the one-day games in, in Melbourne when we were winning against the West Innings and there was a council ruling and the lights went out and we ended up losing on run rate. So then Kerry came to change room. as a bit of a terse exchange. And Ian, uh, Ian stood his ground, yeah. Would Packer cop it from Ian Chappell? I think at that time he probably had to. I think Ian, Ian was the guy. I mean, he was the Australian captain. He was one of the, the forceful people within the World Series setup. And, and I don't think they could have done without him. When World Series finished, players sort of went back to their states. But I remember you were devastated, weren't you? Because, like, it was like your ultimate dream and suddenly you were, like, midstream. Absolutely. Then I had to qualify to play uh, for Australia for another three years. My, my season with World Series was counted in the qualification period, which was four. So I had to do another three with Queensland, which, which of course, is great, playing for Queensland, but uh, I really wanted to try and play uh, international cricket, so that put all that on hold for a while. And finally, after that long period of qualification, you made your test debut famously against England at the Gabba with a century, and uh, the images are still there of Sally shedding tears in the stand. It just must be a golden memory, isn't it? Yeah, it was, a, it was an awesome day because also in that Australian side, I think in the 12, there were seven Queenslanders. So it was an easy transition for me to go into that team and, and what made it even better was we won the Test match as well. So, uh, yeah, it was a great five days. And not long after that, you went to Canberra and met Malcolm Fraser as part of a group function. And I understand he was reasonably cold to you, is that right? <laughs> Well, to put it mildly, very cold, in fact. Um, players introduced him and he just wouldn't shake my hand, turn his back on me. So it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. But, um, you know, I suppose at the time, South Africa being such a, a political hotbed of, of controversy, I, I guess you could sort of understand it. Did it distress you at all? I think it upset me a little bit at the time. Um, I didn't really want to dwell on it because I'd come through all... all my whole career seemed to be involved... Or, with the political theme, which which I didn't really want to dwell on, and um, so I put it behind me. But but I'd be lying if I if I said it didn't at the time. Yeah. Perhaps the greatest challenge of your batting career was Joel Garner. Mm. You were taunted as Big Bird's bunny. That was yep. the nickname. Bowling in towards the leg stump, but but you got him in the end. Yeah. But but tell us about the trauma early on of that. Yeah, for me that that probably was a defining moment in my career because I just felt that the West Indies at that time was you're going to get measured against them of how good a player you were. And I felt that if I couldn't take that step and overcome that challenge and be successful against them, I was going to be forever disappointed in the way that my career went. So, so what happened was that early on they started giving him a new ball and he was difficult to left-handers. I mean, any, anyone will tell you, I think AB had the same issues um, against him then. He, he was quick and he used to get the ball across you. And hard for a left-hander, much more difficult than a Malcolm Marshall or a Michael Holding or a Andy Roberts or any of those sort of guys. I mean, they were all very good, but didn't really bother me in, in the way that he did. So in the end, fortunately, um, it turned around and, and I felt that by the time it had all finished after that test match in Sydney, um, where I was lucky enough to get a big 100, I think it was probably even then. So I could make peace with it. But you practised hard, didn't you? And one of your old tricks was to get a handful of gravel and throw it on a cement practice deck and almost torment yourself a bit, wasn't it? Yeah, I think opening the batting at that time, it was a real fast bowler's era. If you bat in the top order then, it was difficult. So you had to try and simulate 
practice uh, scenarios to, to, to try and make it as, as close to what you're going to face in the game situation as you could. And I spend a lot of time in those valleys practice nets, so try and be creative and, and, and make things more difficult. Do you feel today's players are softer, Kepler? I think today's is very different. I think with the advent of, of T20 cricket, I think the focus has changed. I think priorities have changed. I mean, for us, you know, we enjoyed playing one-day cricket, but for us, test cricket was, was the be and end all. I think the baggy green in a five-day game was where it's at. Whereas I think today, there's so many other things that come into it. Uh, it's an easier way to earn your living going from T20 to T20 tournament to T20 tournament and uh, and just following that sort of circuit. And I think the younger, younger players coming through see that and they see the rewards on offer. So I think it's just very different. Let's talk about the Rebel Tours uh, of South Africa in the mid-1980s. Now, you were often accused of organising them, weren't you? And you paid a high price because people thought you did. What's your story? Yeah, I was never involved in any organisation of anything like that. That was all Ali Bacha and, and, and the South African Cricket Association of the time. I think those Rebel Tours, in retrospect, should never have happened. I suppose if you look at it from a, a South African point of view, they had to keep international cricket going in some shape or form, but those tours just didn't work. And by the time that that Mike Gatting England tour arrived there, it had, it had run its course. Why didn't they work? Well, I think that you wouldn't understand it if we were just an Australian player going to South Africa and playing cricket. You wouldn't really get that. But the political bubble in South Africa was coming to boiling point. And it was coming towards a time in the mid late eighties where where things were pretty uh, pretty hectic in South Africa, and I think that that didn't add to peace and stability in the country. Not that there was any, because there wasn't. And it was all leading into the release of Nelson Mandela in 1991, and South Africa then eventually getting back into the international stage. So they were, I think they they probably, if you look back on it. Probably shouldn't have happened. People rang you regarding the tours, didn't they? Like, were you sort of a sounding board to players? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think from a, a South African point of view, there, there were quite a few guys who, who played in, in the Queensland side, for instance, who, who went there. I think guys like Trevor Holmes, John Maguire, those sort of guys. And um, I knew the South African situation inside out. I knew the people that they were dealing with because uh, I came through, through that system. So from that point of view, there were definitely uh, conversations that, uh, that happened in, uh, in that way. Creed Australia thought that you were involved, so they slashed your contract mm. and basically forced you out of the country, didn't they? Your, your contract fee was slashed from 35000 to 12000 a year. Yeah, and, and that was after a 12-month period where Alan Bourne and myself scored the most runs uh, in in the Australian team. It was we played the West Indies in that series, then we had the '85 Ashes Ashes series, and it happened straight after that. We just lost the Ashes. Um, a number of those experienced players had retired. It was a difficult period in Australian cricket as well, and 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 not necessarily a very pleasant one. So the whole environment at the time wasn't uh, wasn't a great one. So you played a Sheffield Shield final for Queensland, and at the presentation. You said, I'd like to thank the Australian Cricket Board for forcing me out of the country, basically. Yeah. They were very strong words, weren't they? Yeah. And you were obviously furious at the time. Yeah, at the time, it was all, all emotion. Um, what I was very pleased about, though, was um, when I came back in 92, I think David Richards was then the CEO of Australian Cricket. I think Fred Bennett might have been president, I think. And I was able to then reconnect with those people because I think at the time emotions were running so high that when I look back on that again, it was at the presentation uh, and all that sort of thing. That probably could have been left unsaid maybe at that time, but I was just glad that I was able to then reconnect with those people and there was really no problem. And Alan Border said your relationship with him became fractured at the mm -hmm. time and he said in the press, I'm not sure what Kepler wants out of his cricket. And he, you left a note under his door saying, OK, smart ass. if you want to sort it out downstairs sort of thing. You know, a real flashpoint between two guys who'd known each other forever, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. We, we, always had, um, we always had a good relationship. I mean, we went to Queensland. I went the year before Alan, and then Alan came and we played together all this time. That incident did happen, but not in a sense that there was never going to be a physical confrontation. It was more just 
you know, let's try and, and talk through it and, and, and so on. But yeah, I mean, Alan doesn't bear grudges and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we still, our relationship's pretty good. Kepler, nothing has rocked South Africa quite like the Hunsi Cronier match-fixing scandal and his subsequent death. Now, you're both Bloemfontein boys. You knew him well. His mother was your tennis coach for a while. How did you take it all? By the time it happened, I, I wasn't surprised. Um, I never thought it would happen, clearly. I mean, Hans is 12 years younger than me, so I basically brought him into the side. And when he came into the team, he did all the right things. I mean, he trained very hard, very competitive, really wanted to do well, and, and his heart was in the right place. Then in 1995, uh, or 94, I think, in, in Pakistan, which was my last tour and a tour that I didn't want to go on. It was a, a one-day tour. That's when the inference of the match-fixing thing started, and I became aware of it. I actually went to Peter Pollock and I said, look, um, a couple of the Australian players, because we're involved in the triangular series, told me that they'd been offered money to underperform. And I'm just letting you know that nobody's said anything to me. But then Ansi made a few comments during the, the last couple of games that led me to believe that things weren't 100% right. Well, we picked up a wicket and we were in the huddle and we had Pakistan 120 for four or something. And he came into the huddle and sort of said, oh, don't worry about this, we're going to win this one because they, they're not trying to win it. And, really? I, and I'm like going, where's that coming from? So, but then after that tour, I retired. And then I was watching a game three or four months later in Cape Town where South Africa got 200. And after 12 overs, Pakistan were like 70 without loss. And suddenly 130 all out, two or three run out straight to John T. Rhodes. And I looked at that and I thought, no, nah, this can't be right. And then I, I remembered those sort of conversations and I started to think all is not well. How do you reconcile what happened to Cronje? I've often thought about that and, and, I, and I, to, to be honest with you, I don't really know because he came through a very respectable family, a comfortable family as far as finances are concerned, so it was never a case of there wasn't enough money available. Possibly the fact that he was a very popular South African captain, he might have looked at the situation and thought that I'm very powerful in the South African sporting setup. He lived in the same estate as Ernie Els and maybe thought, well, these guys are earning super amounts of money. I'm as popular as them. Maybe I should earn as much as them. I mean, I can't really put it down to anything. But look, I think overall it, it was a, a tragic situation, um, not only for him, for his family, for the whole country, for the, for the sporting nation of South Africa. And I think if you look at it and what happened to him ultimately with his death, indirectly the fact that he was in the position that he was in probably led to that tragic accident and he didn't deserve that. What about match fixing as a whole? There was a feeling that it was rampant around that time, that, that they only ever scratched the surface with it. Did, do you agree with that? In my playing time, I was never aware of it once. I only became aware of it really after I retired and then everything came out about some of the players who'd been involved in it. I mean, we played a, a full series against India when Mohamed Azaruddin was the opposing captain to me. And, uh, and, and I had no idea, no idea at all. Um, certainly, I was never approached. When you went back to South Africa, you played for the Australian Rebels briefly, didn't yeah. you? And you dropped a quote about that time, which I thought was fascinating, and you said, the trouble with playing for two countries is you can be considered an outsider by both. Could you explain that? Yeah, I think, if I'm brutally honest, I must say I probably felt more at home in the Australian dressing room because I think what happened when South Africa got back into the international fold. That was six years later after I finished playing for Australia. So in the South African setup, there'd been a number of established players like Clive Rice, Jimmy Cook, these guys that were all at the end of their careers but still playing and feeling entitled to play for South Africa when they came back because of the loyal service that they'd given South Africa all that time. And I'd been away, played for another country came back in and, and they, I suppose the feeling from their point of view was that I had the best of both worlds. So there was a, a little bit of a controversy when I was offered the captaincy in 92 to take the side to the World Cup. But, uh, you know, for me, it was a case of I was offered the job, I was going to try and do as well as I possibly could uh, as a captain and as a player. Jimmy Cook and Clive Rice really seemed to agitate against you. Like, it was quite public, wasn't it? Um, it wasn't enjoyable. I mean, I think they tried, they had a petition up and running, all these sorts of things. To uh, stop you being captain? Yeah, to stop me from being captain. 
But, uh, you know, I, I was so used to, at that time, to controversy and to all these things happening that I just put my head down, did as well as I could, and uh, I didn't really worry too much about it. And South Africa's entry back to international cricket was extraordinary, wasn't it? Well, like, within a week, you're off to India. Then the breakneck pace continued and you were back in the 1992 World Cup when no-one expected you to be there and, of course, made the semi-finals. And it, it, it created hysteria, didn't it, in South Africa? Yeah, it did. Uh, our first game was against Australia. I was very apprehensive about that match because I didn't know what sort of a reception we would get um, on the on the way to the ground on the bus um, you could hear a pin drop I mean it was so quiet I remember looking around the bus and thinking I don't know how we're going to get through this game but um, somehow we won that game lost a couple but then got on a roll and uh, and and qualified for that uh, heartbreaking semi-final um, against England which I mean we could have we may have we may not have won who knows but um, with that rain rule it went from needing 13 of 22 balls to suddenly one ball and, and 22 runs. Um, and had the Duckworth Lewis applied at that time, um, we would have won by three runs, actually. Someone told me, some statistician told me after that. But, uh, yeah, so it's an emotional ride. And uh, when we got back to South Africa, as you said, the country was, was really behind, uh, behind the team. When we arrived, the airport, the airport was packed with people. And then the next day through, through the streets of, of Johannesburg. And, and, and that really unified South Africa. I think it was, a, it was a great thing for the country as a whole. I think it was the first time probably that, that everybody came together to support one sporting team. So it, it was a wonderful experience. How do you sum yourself up as a cricketer, you and your journey? Because it's so unique, isn't it? Yeah, I think for me, cricket was hard work. I think it was not something that, I enjoyed while I was doing it. It was something that I more enjoyed when it was finished. For me, it was all about the challenge of scoring runs and it didn't come easily, always. So it was a struggle, but one that I, I wouldn't trade for the world. I think I could have had a better balance, could have been more philosoph philosophical and I, and I could have approached it a little bit differently. And, and hindsight is always, as we know, uh, a perfect science, but I probably would have changed a few things, yeah. It's a great story, Kepler. I've loved having you here today. Congratulations on a wonderful career, and it's nice to see you. Thank you. Good to be back. Thanks very much.